In my last video, I defined some basic ideas that all democratic free schools have in common, and I argue that it is time to move beyond the walls of our schools, to use those ideas as a lens to look outward with the goal of creating democratic free communities. I hope that I gave listeners something to think about so that you could begin reflecting on other aspects of your lives, planning how they could be democratized. But when our society constantly tells us through both subconscious and conscious stories that there is just one acceptable correct path, it can be very hard to imagine an entirely different paradigm. With this video, I hope to tie together some seemingly disparate pictures into something more coherent, just a few among many possibilities that we could work towards. So, what could a democratic free community look like? To answer this question, let us return back to the four basic principles that make up a democratic free school and see how they might be applied to broader society. One, direct democracy. We talk about direct democracy as if it is either some new, hip, futuristic form of governance or some outdated, tried but miserably failed idea that we all collectively know better now. Maybe you hear that it only works on so big a scale. But our societies are so complex now that we're long since past that being a possibility. But the truth is, direct democracy and decentralized shared power in communities is a constant current running throughout all of history. I like how the Kurdish political theorist Abdullah Ocalan sees the historical confluence of democracy, society, and the state. It is instructive for us because we are building democratic societal institutions with our schools that necessarily run us into conflict with the state and the power imbalances it protects. The state prefers monocultures, rigidity, standardization, hierarchy, and metrics. We can see that perfectly in its school system. Democratic free schools are polycultures, flexible, varied, non-hierarchical, and qualitative. Our schools rely on flexible, shared guidelines and ethics. The state would rather replace those with law. Our schools rely on participatory politics. The state would rather us submit to bureaucratic administration and suppressive regulations. Because of this, we not only don't get financial or political support from the state, but we also often face hurdles that the state is likely to put in our path. Ojalan sees our movement as part of a long historical counterpower of society pushing to democratize itself in all aspects of life in conflict with and at the expense of state power. I'll quote from him at length. Democratic modernity though it has changed form according to different eras, has always existed and sustained itself as the other face of official civilization's history, in essence as the moral and political unity of societal nature. It signifies a system of universal history that is outside of the forces of tyranny and exploitation. Despite suppression and exploitation by the official world system, the other face of society could not be eliminated. Contrary to popular belief, democracy is not a form of statecraft. Democracy shares the same area as the state, which is the official expression of all forms of capital, ownership, and power. By restricting the state, democracy widens society's sphere of freedom. We can define democracy as the self-governance of a non-state society. Democracy is governance that is not state. It is the power of communities to govern themselves without the state. Contrary to popular belief, since its formation, human society has experienced democracy more than it has experienced the state. The emergence of society's existence is communal and democratic. The state can only rule by growing at the expense of communality and democracy. There's a dialectic relationship between the two. Less of one is more of the other. Full democracy is statelessness. Full state sovereignty is the denial of democracy. Democracy's fundamental function becomes evident in this manner. It can only increase the opportunities for freedom and equality 
by restricting the state, making it smaller, and by trimming its octopus-like tentacles and their power over society. Towards the end of the process, perhaps the state will become redundant and sizzle out. The conclusion we draw from this is that the relationship between the state and democracy is not one of toppling another, but of transcendence. If we agree with Ojalan, then we can be empowered to realize ourselves as part of a struggle for increased democracy in society that is as old as society itself. In ignorance of this fact, one of the first complaints we will get when talking about the need to apply the democratic principles of free schools to broader society is the democratic free school is all fine and good, but there's no way you could expand it to a larger society. In fact, there are many examples in history and several strong examples from the present that are compatible to expand on the freedom first nurtured in the free school. I've covered these models extensively in some of my other videos, so I'll just add in a few quick excerpts to get you an idea. I highly recommend watching these videos in full because the models I covered in them filled me up with an enduring hope and inspiration, and I hope they can do the same for you. If we accept the premise that those closest to the consequences of a decision know best how to make that decision, then we know that any future sustainable economy will have to be powered by strong decentralized communities. In order to build strong communities, we have to overcome the social isolation that we have grown so accustomed to here in America and places like it. Not so long ago in America, most of us belonged to social clubs in our towns that tied us to one another. We often voluntarily chipped in to local funds so that if a neighbor got sick, we could help them cover their care. If a person responsible for reporting children or spouses died, we could make sure the surviving family members were provided for. Since the 1980s, and really before that, there's been a major push towards individualization of activity in many parts of the so-called developed world. Individual expression as consumers, individualized notions of self-care from a hard day that seeks relief in isolating ourselves in the bathtub, in meditation, or in binge-watching a Netflix series on our phone, the list goes on. We are replacing activities traditionally done in community with activities done alone or in very small groups. To give you an idea of just how bad this has gotten, consider this. There were more Americans involved in bowling clubs in the 1970s than there are Americans involved in any organized extracurricular activity today. By getting to know our neighbors on a more tangible level and re-establishing networks of shared survival, we can rebuild strong communities, creating a local base that is collectively in tune to our local needs and desires. Within these communities, we can begin to take back power over the decisions that affect our lives. If we set to work building these strong communities through community organizing, as governments fail to meet the needs of communities, these networks of mutual aid can essentially step in and replace the state. These networks can link up wherever they arise and shift resources around and help each other out. Once again, people know far better what they and their neighbors need than politicians do. And if we create the spaces to make directly democratic decisions together and ways to enforce them, I believe we will find greater happiness and control over our lives. We should seek to establish resilient, autonomous, and self-governing, directly democratic, communities that don't outsource power to politicians, that live ecologically, and limit hierarchy. Luckily for us, we are not without models to light a path forward. On the large societal scale, we have the Zapatistas in Chiapas, Mexico, and Rojava, northern Syria, both of which I have talked about in previous videos. Both places encompass hundreds of thousands to millions of people who have kicked out the government, spread power around to as many people as possible, organized women and ethnic minorities, and set about undoing the environmental damage that state and heavy industry has done to their natural features, all while reclaiming traditional knowledge on how to be stewards of the land. We have the Zona de Fondo, or Zone to Defend, 
in rural France, where resident farmers called for activists and ecologists to come build homes and tend the land in the path of a proposed airport that would destroy the beautiful marshy ecology of the Bocage. Here thousands of acres have been saved, ecological homes have been built in a plethora of diverse methods, and a whole localized society living freely and meeting their needs without laws imposed from above, cops, or homelessness has emerged. Throughout Mexico, whole towns are declaring themselves autonomous from the Mexican state kicking out politicians, corrupt police, and cartels that put profits over sustainability. They have built their own elected, rotating, and accountable security forces to keep authority out, revived traditional indigenous decision-making bodies, established rotating stewards of local forests, and rediscovered suppressed cultures. In Guatemala, communities have begun to take back control over their traditional forests and manage them sustainably and cooperatively, without relying on the state. I spent a day in Copenhagen walking around a self-organized nature preserve in the heart of the city, managed by rotating volunteer groups of residents, and watched and listened in awe as the vast diversity of birds overwhelmed my senses. In Jackson, Mississippi, predominantly black communities are building vast networks of worker-owned cooperatives, neighborhood assemblies, eco-villages on community land trusts controlled by the residents, and small-scale production workshops creating sustainable local economies for the area confined within ecological limits set by those affected. In contrast to the state giving up on more and more sacrifice zones, whether in Flint, Michigan, Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, decentralized grassroots disaster relief is more effectively reaching people, empowering them to take control over their own recovery and creating long-term sustainability and autonomous sources of energy and infrastructure long after the television cameras leave. I'll add to that the experiences of certain religious groups that have been making decisions together without hierarchy for centuries. Probably the most well-known is the Quakers, formerly known as the Society of Friends. Quaker meetings are autonomous and run without a central authority. All decisions have been and are made through collective processes of the whole body, as they listen and wait to be led towards a consensus. The Baha'i faith, first growing out of Iran and the Middle East, embraces a, quote, non-adversarial model of collective decision-making that they refer to as consultation. And of course, indigenous systems of decision-making all over the world often revolve around shared power, hearing many voices from different sectors of the community before making a decision that can be consented to by the community. We see this from the Haudenosaunee and Inuit bands in North America, to the Kung and Hadza hunter-gatherers on the African continent. Right now, many of these initiatives seem isolated, few, and far between, no matter how impressive they may be. But what if these people-powered initiatives began to link up? What if we were a part of that? We already have seen many coalitions form to link non-conventional schools and educational paths together. We've seen these expand even to find individuals who have taken self-directed paths, whether those be career paths, learning paths, or others. Why not this infrastructure to connect self-directed communities or democratic free communities around the world? These communities can begin to exchange ideas and goods between each other and build intricate web-like support networks that blur political and cultural borders. Anyone, any organization, any place that shares a common mindset, a consciousness of freedom and cooperation, and directly democratic governance can be a potential friend. Linked up, they can create visibility to people around the world that there is an alternative. A world within a world, growing like mustard seeds through the cracks. These are the kinds of societal organizations that continue the participatory path that our students will start in our democratic free school. Two, leadership through guidance and not authority. All of us, whether we admit it or not, search out guidance, people who can point us on the right path. All vibrant, healthy societies have placed an emphasis on the role of the elder, those not always of old age, 
that have acquired a certain wisdom in life, whose own experiences are likely to be useful and instructive for the challenges we, as individuals and as societies, face ahead of us. As Stephen Jenkinson points out, elderhood is not something that is automatically given with age, but it must be conferred upon a person by those who seek them out. Elderhood has traditionally implied a kind of duty, not a kind of command. This duty is thrust on the elder through those looking for elders, and can be taken away once the elder loses respect. And historically, most elder positions have been influential but not coercive. They impart their wisdom, but it is up to you to decide if you want to heed it, or risk not doing so and potentially face the consequences of warnings unheeded. These leadership positions have ritual and moral power, but not judicial and coercive power, and receive no special privileges. This is the role that adults should ideally play in democratic free schools. They cannot force a student to do anything. They are there to give advice when prompted, or to point the kids towards resources that will further them on their quest for knowledge. They have no more and no less decision-making power than the students, and the influence they have is based on trust and that trust can be withdrawn by the student. Likewise, there are well-respected figures within broader society that lead by guidance and not authority. Doctors and nurses are a great example. Even today, your doctor can't force you to undergo any operation or test. But if she recommends that we should do something because we trust her experience, we will most likely follow her instructions. A distinction can be made between a leader, guide, elder, or influence and an authority. The former category is temporary, based in competence, is constantly subject to review and the loss of title by those who look up to the person. The leader and the subject are equals except in a degree of skill in one particular interest. Leaders help to empower others, so they can eventually take control over the facet of their life that they now seek guidance on. The authorities, on the other hand, exercise power over people. They hang a carrot or a stick over our heads to coerce us into acting in their interests. Examples of authorities can be seen in the position of politician, judge, police officer, and boss, to name a few. All of these positions either create or enforce decisions over people that have little to no say in them. If our broader society were to learn from the democratic preschool model, where leadership positions are temporary, often rotating, based on merit, recallable, non-coercive, and given mandates by those they represent, we would have to build up new structures to govern our lives. Politicians might be replaced with elected and recallable spokespersons, who only coordinate the decisions we all make at our local councils, be they school meetings, neighborhood meetings, or workers' councils. These assemblies would involve the whole community, who would be empowered to shape its own environment, from where common and social space is to be located to what types of ideas and people are celebrated in monuments. Instead of having the power to unilaterally decide for us like politicians, spokespersons or delegates who only carry out the orders we give them. These spokespersons would not be much different than the school meeting spokespersons who inform one committee on the actions of another, or who carry out a specific task they are delegated. Judges might be replaced by structures similar to the judicial committees or mediation circles we have in our democratic schools. Local neighborhoods might form committees with elected and recallable mediators who rotate among the society so that everyone eventually gets the chance to be a peacemaker. These bodies would reject the punishment focus of our current judicial system and instead seek to achieve consensus between disputants, searching for the reasons that the dispute occurred in the first place and seeking to eliminate the conditions that cause a person to harm another. Police officers might be replaced by rotating and elected community defense members, every one of which is accountable only to the mandates given them by the directly democratic structures of the community. They could be subject to individual review and regular criticism and self-criticism sessions by the community, and stripped of power if they violate their instructions. In democratic schools, there are no special enforcers of the rules. Since everyone gets a direct say on the rules, chronic rule breakers just aren't as likely, as a rule isn't made if it is likely to be repeatedly violated. The rules are flexible so that those who disagree 
can continually bring them up at meetings and attempt to change them. It is the job of everyone to keep each other up to the standards they have set for themselves. In democratic free communities, a similar responsibility would be required from all. Such a community defense committee, as discussed earlier, could rotate so frequently that eventually everyone has a chance to play that role. All of these measures limit the ability of this temporary power to be abused. If you are interested more in how law, conflict, and security structures can be decentralized and put into the hands of everyone, I highly recommend that you watch my documentary, The Communes of Rojava, a model in societal self-direction, based on the millions of people doing just that in the autonomous administrations of North and East Syria. You can even find short clips on my YouTube channel relating to each specific aspect that I've talked about above. Bosses could be replaced by directly democratic workers' councils, as is modeled in the over 400 worker-owned cooperatives currently active in the United States, and the hundreds of thousands more around the world. These are essentially school meetings, but instead of running schools between staff and students, they run workplaces among workers. Many democratic schools are already run this way, with the business aspects of the school subject to the same democratic processes as everything else instead of being decided over by a central authority figure. Today, cooperatives can be found in just about every industry, except those that only benefit from propping up small groups of elite power holders. And for those industries, we might just be better off if they didn't exist in the first place. Even large firms can form cooperatives. For those, instead of having one giant assembly of all workers, they might have assemblies for each department with elected and recallable spokespersons or managers to coordinate between departments. Just about every position of coercive authority could be replaced by either someone who is a respected and temporary leader on a particular subject, or by all of us sharing that position's tasks and responsibilities equally. Again, those that can't, maybe we should question how useful they are to us in the first place. Such a decentralization of power is a massive undertaking, but it doesn't have to be done all in one go, and it has already begun to happen on blocks, towns, regions, and territories, big and small, all around the world. If we can popularize the idea that we should decentralize power in schools, so contrary to the very worldviews of so many people, and with centralization always thought to be a mainstay of modern education, then what's another leap to our neighborhoods, municipalities, and workplaces too? And again, there are already people who spend much of their time doing just this work. It's time that we see those people as our allies in a democratic push from below. Three, play. It is not a coincidence that a school that decentralizes power among everyone also highly emphasizes the importance of play. Peter Gray, one of the foremost voices of the self-directed learning movement, has long stressed that play itself is necessarily egalitarian. As he wrote in Psychology Today, play always requires a suspension of aggression and dominance along with a heightened sensitivity to the needs and desires of the other players. Players may recognize that one playmate is better at the played activity than are others, but that recognition must not lead the one who is better to lord it over the others. Interestingly, the last sentence about it not being socially acceptable for even those who are obviously better at a certain game to lord it over others goes rather well with the principle we just discussed of leaders not turning into authorities. All of these aspects compound on one another and play can be seen as the glue that holds all of the principles of democratic free schools together. Recognizing the tendency for play to reduce inequality and hierarchy among players, Peter Gray recognizes that those seeking an egalitarian and non-hierarchical life should try to make as many aspects of their lives playful as possible. Hunter-gatherers, some of the most egalitarian societies on earth, happen to carry a playful attitude in most everything they do. And Gray argues this is not a coincidence. Humans have evolved with a very wide spectrum of natural behavior. We can be incredibly egalitarian and cooperative or dangerously dominating. Play, then, is one antidote we have to the worst parts of our nature. 
The more societies build mechanisms that emphasize play, the more egalitarian they will be. With anthropological evidence, Gray finds in hunter-gatherer bands much more leisure time. The work they do hunting and gathering is done playfully, incorporated into games. Their rituals are playful, their practices of sharing and trade are playful, and they even use playful means like humor and ridicule to hold each other accountable to their cooperatively decided on social norms. Play is seen as one of the major reasons that bands like the Kung and the broader San people have thrived in roughly the same areas for tens of thousands of years, without any evidence to suggest that they ever developed a centralized coercive authority or state. There are lots of promising ways that our society here in the industrialized United States might be able to turn much of our now menial work into more playful activity. Automation, which can seem scary when our livelihoods are tied to our ability to work for wages for employers, has the potential to be something we embrace, as it can free us up from tasks few people enjoy to focus on the tasks that we take pleasure in. In my experience working with kids in conventional schools, I've witnessed more schools integrating work into game formats, whether cooperative or competitive. Workplaces have increasingly looked into gamification as a way to increase motivation among staff. While this can exacerbate the problems under the current hierarchical business models by being a tool for making workers complain less in the face of the same old power plays, when done by the subversive self-initiative of workers, this kind of playful labor can be liberating. If we start approaching work that needs to be done as a chance to inventively play a new kind of game, and we do this as equals, then we have a possibility of growing a seed of cooperation and egalitarianism in our broader society. I want to leave you on this point with an example of turning menial tasks into a game from my own experience in a democratic school. As part of our responsibility to our community, all staff and students do a daily chore. One day, the art room was particularly messy, and the poor girl who had the chore was more than a little frustrated. I told her I would help, and through us talking, we, mostly her, came up with a little game. All out against the invaders of the cleanliness! An invasion has hit planet Earth! Their sole purpose is to make humans miserable by making messes! Today, they have set their sights on the art room and have manifested themselves in something oddly similar to paint splotches. Young students had a blast providing air support with the Windex and spray cleaner for a teacher with a rag. Within minutes, a whole team of students who aren't usually excited about doing their own chore, let alone anyone else's, were enjoying cleaning the art room. This is an area of applied free school principles that I think still needs to be fleshed out in this context. But if those of us who experience these playful environments every day start to playfully think about how we can gamify more aspects of our lives, I have no doubt that we will succeed in helping our students carry that youthful spirit into their adult lives and make the world a more fascinating place to be. Four, full freedom to explore one's individual passions and desires. In the democratic free school community, we talk about cultivating lifelong learners. It is true that a passion for learning is a natural human trait, innate in all of us, but it is so often buried under mounds of compulsory tests, grades, reports, and other busy work forced upon us through our school and work lives. In free schools, we stoke the fire of the natural human inquisitiveness not by forcing more paper into it, thereby suffocating it, but by giving it oxygen, room to breathe, tending to its needs when prompted, but letting it burn its own path. But what would it look like if that same passion was stoked throughout one's life? The social pressure is on individuals to choose a career path right out of college and stick to it, to leave behind silly hobbies and get serious. We're always told that those hobbies can be picked back up at a later date. But by the time we are done working, the passions might be gone, the creative energy might be crushed out of us, we might be sick, we might not have enough time. How many people have put their dreams on hold for the pragmatic path and never been able to return to them? How many potential poets, artists, inventors will never discover or have a platform to express their passions because they've spent every waking hour in a sweatshop somewhere or they rush from unfulfilling service job to unfulfilling service job just to be able to afford rent? 
As I mentioned before, there are so many jobs that could be automated away or divided among communities so that no one person has to do too much of a necessary but grading job. All of this could free up plenty of time for people to follow their dreams. Hunter-gatherers have no advanced technology and once worked an estimated 15 hours a week. The work they did have to do was fulfilling and necessary work. John Maynard Keynes estimated back in 1930 that automation would free up humanity to 15-hour work weeks once again by the 21st century. Sadly, the desire for profit led to employers deciding that if a machine reduced the amount of work needed by half, it was better to lay off half the workforce and have the remainder work the same hours than to keep all their employees but just have them work half as much. If businesses were run like school meetings, with democracy being the rule of the workplace, automation could mean vacations, not layoffs. It is clear that whenever we talk about freedom to search out one's passions, we inevitably run into the problems of economic justice, which itself could spawn a whole nother video on the challenges of economic accessibility within democratic free schools. But I'll have to save that one for later. Despite this scaling back on the potential for leisure time, which would allow more people to have more time to pursue their interests to the fullest, the open source movement has done a fantastic job handling the access to resources part of the equation. In democratic free schools, staff are mainly there to connect students to the resources they need to develop their desires. But the open source community has provided a promising incubator for that same purpose outside of the school. Thanks to a spirit, of international free cooperation without profit, a vast network of tools are at our fingertips if we know where to look and if we can rest back some free time for ourselves. One of the most well-known operating systems of all time, GNU Linux, was put together through the collaboration of a group of people on an internet chat room who like tinkering with code and remains completely based on free software. Wikipedia provides us with free information on just about every subject imaginable and is literally a database compiling the near totality of human knowledge, is open to input from everyone, and has developed a complex form of participatory governance based on volunteers. Fab Labs and Makerspaces are a growing movement that is decentralizing the ability to produce, create, design, innovate, putting once highly expensive and expert operated machines into control by local communities. These often run by a form of participatory decision making tailored specifically for makerspaces, duocracy. A working class kid in the inner city, thanks to the expanding of the commons, now potentially has access to and autonomy with machines that were only in the hands of the most wealthy and technologically savvy companies just a decade ago. Time banks have popped up in cities and villages across the world that allow people to use time as a currency instead of money to share skills with each other, meet each other's needs, and learn new skills from a wide range of people in their locality. Tool libraries have often grown hand in hand with time banks, as they allow neighbors to share tools with one another without each person having to save up for and store an expensive tool they might only use once or twice a year. Even seeds, the building block of life, are now being saved and shared and stored for future use and allow laypersons to build local food autonomy and breed new plants suitable to their local conditions. These growing movements, decentralized, local, and democratically controlled, giving communities power over the means to sustain themselves, are our natural allies as democratic free schools. We should be building networks with these infrastructural projects. All of them give people the means to follow what makes them happy, what interests and inspires them in a material way, tearing down paywalls, and giving them access to tools that they can have some autonomy over. Imagine the creativity and ingenuity possible in a society where every single person has free and unlimited access to every computer software, all sorts of tools and workshops, and similar infrastructure simply by virtue of being human. Imagine that society if it is not constrained by the fear of taking risks that can be pervasive when food, housing, and clothing uncertainty is a reality. That biome would only be the logical extension of the free pursuit of interests and passions at the heart of the democratic free school movement. These are the kinds of possibilities available to us when we turn outwards towards our communities, 
spreading our principles incubating in our schools around to the other aspects of our lives. These are the building blocks of democratic free communities. What is clear is that all over the world, there are growing waves of projects that embrace principles that democratic free schools also share. Direct democracy and shared power and community, leadership through guidance and not authority, play, and the freedom to explore one's passions and desires, but in their own specialties, be it in workplaces, community governance, food autonomy, creative commons, or through an entire social revolution. It is equally clear that there are large power structures that lose their grip on the intricacies of our lives if they allow these budding movements to continue and connect with one another, and that they will try to do everything that they can to maintain their control, whether that means surveillance, regulations, fees, or even more outright force. As throughout all of history, democratic modernity is in a struggle to squeeze through the cracks of a modernity based on hierarchy and control and we in democratic free schools are necessarily a part of that struggle. It is time that more of us recognize our role in that struggle and link up with like-minded organizations to push outward, to change the world that we live in so that our kids inherit a world that lives up to the standards they live every day in free schools and so they can transition more smoothly beyond school, continuing to have spaces where they can exercise direct democracy, where they can find guidance from elders and become elders themselves, where they can play, and where they can follow their passions and desires to the fullest extent they wish. Now is the time to take our guiding principles as a democratic free school movement and use them to develop a lens with which we can look outward. When we look through this lens and see the other aspects of our own lives and the world around us lacking in comparison, we will have a good foundation with which to create a solid critique of what is and a vibrant vision of what can be.